Chapter 6, Probability, Part 2. Probability in the normal distribution. Normal distribution is a common shape. It entails the following characteristics. A normal distribution is symmetrical. The highest frequency is in the middle. Frequencies taper off toward the extremes. The normal distribution was first introduced in Chapter 2 as an example of a commonly occurring shape for population distributions. So an example of something that's normally distributed would include anything that grows in nature. So we can think of the size of an apple. Its uh, distribution of growth is normal, where we have an average size apple and we have extremely small apples and extremely large apples. Um, the height of a child um, is also normally distributed. Um, where we have the average height of a particular age of a child, and we have extreme heights um, on the high end and the low end. The exact shape of the normal distribution is specified by a mathematical equation relating to each x value, the score, with each y value, its frequency. And um, each normal distribution can be described by the proportions of area contained in each section. When we refer to area, we're, we're talking about sections of the normal distribution. So, um, for instance, the proportion of a distribution above the mean, below the mean, above a, an extreme score, below um, an extreme high score, um, below an extreme low score. So area will pertain to a certain section or probability of a distribution. So again, we have um, an understanding of what the normal distribution looks like. Again, based on these characteristics, it's symmetrical. And this is frequency, and these are our x values. Again, the highest frequency occurring in the center in the center of the distribution. And the frequency tapers off as we move from the center into the tails of a distribution. So when we talk about the area, again, we may be interested in the proportion of scores above the mean, above the average. So this is the area of interest, or we may be considering the proportions of scores below the mean. And we're going to learn that z-scores are used to identify these sections. To partition off a certain portion of a distribution, um, we will be able to do so with the z-score. Again, remember that the z-score identifies the location in a distribution in terms of standard deviations from the mean. Statisticians often identify sections of a normal distribution using z-scores. So in this figure, figure 6.4, we see a normal distribution with several sections marked in z-score units. So here is one standard deviation unit above the mean, two standard deviation units above, above the mean. Um, on the opposite side, one standard deviation unit below the mean and two standard deviation units below the mean. So we will be converting x values into z-scores, again, using our equation, z is equal to x minus mu divided by standard deviation, if we have um, population parameters, or z is equal to x minus m over s if we're working with sample statistics. And once we convert a z, um, x value into a z-score, again, what we're doing is identifying the location of that x value expressed in standard deviation units. And this particular slide indicates the proportion or percentage of scores that fall between the mean of a distribution and one standard deviation unit. So if we're talking about the values or x values between the mean and one standard deviation unit, and this is applicable to any distribution that's normal, we understand that 34.13% of the scores in the distribution will fall within that range of scores of the mean and one standard deviation unit. Again, one standard deviation unit is applicable to a particular x value. Um, so in terms of proportions, that would be 0.3413. Now, at this point, um, we should be able to discuss this concept of 
um, 70 percent within one standard deviation unit above and below. So I, we've, we were introduced to that idea back in Chapter 4. It's con continued in Chapter 5. And um, this is mathematically how we come up with that estimate of 70% of scores within one standard deviation unit above and below the mean of any normal distribution. If I say that 34.13% of scores <clears throat> fall within the mean and one standard deviation unit above the mean, then we would understand, because this is symmetrical, that that's the same proportion that occurs below the mean one standard deviation unit out. So if we were to take those proportions, so again we're saying here in this area to the left of the mean that I shaded red, that also encompasses 34.13% of all scores in the distribution. So if we add those together, 34.13 plus 34.13, we get 6, 2, 8, 68. So this is why we often say there's approximately 70% of the scores occurring in a normal distribution between one standard deviation unit above and one standard deviation unit below. And again, this has all been determined mathematically. And the math behind this is not something that we're going to go into. It's at the level of calculus, and it's not necessary for us to know all of those intricate mathematical procedures, we just need to understand that if we're working with anything that's normally distributed, this, um, these proportions will always be the same. So again, now you can see why we say approximately 70% of the scores fall within one standard deviation unit above and below. Again, that's the majority of the scores. And visually, it makes sense because that's where the highest frequency is occurring. This um, particular slide in, in figure 6.4 also indicates that between the percentage of scores of a normal distribution between one and two standard deviation units, so this area here, accounts for 13.9, uh, excuse me, 13.59 percent of all the scores, and that would be the same on this end of the distribution. So since it's the characteristic of a normal distribution is that it's symmetrical, then this is a mirror image on this side of the distribution as well. And then finally, between um, one, excuse me, beyond two standard deviation units, that accounts for 2.28% of a distribution or um, any normal distribution to be more precise. And so let's just shade this all in, again, mirror image on either side of the distribution. So going back to measures of central tendency, the mean, median, and mode, we did learn that um, in a normal distribution, in the center of that distribution, we will see that the mean is, is um, represented in addition to the median and the mode. They're all in the center when it's normally distributed. They would all be equal to one another. And um, in addition to the definition of the mathematical center that's represented by the mu, we also understand the median indicates that that um, illustrates 50% of the scores above and 50% of the scores below. So if we just learn that um, these are the percentages that correspond to these different sections of a normal distribution, and we know the definition of the median says that 50% of scores occur above the mean and 50% below the mean, then you should see that mathematically that these three values, three, these three percentages, or they could also be read as proportions, would equal 50%. So I want you in your calculators to affirm this so that you don't just take my word for it, that you add these three values together and you will see that it counts for 50% of the scores. And since it's a mirror image on the, the area below the mean, that it's also 50% um, on that side as well. So that accounts for 50% of all scores below, 50% of, of scores above, and that tells us that we are 
uh, working with the entire 100% of the distribution. Again, these proportions or percentages have all been mathematically calculated, but we're going to use them as a way to, again, dissect the distribution in a manner that um, is of interest to us. What percentage of scores are above a particular value, above one standard deviation unit, between um, one standard deviation unit below and one standard deviation unit above, beyond two standard deviation units above. So depending on how we dissect the distribution, we can use the unit normal table to figure out those specific proportions that can also be read as a percentage. Now I did produce a video that's entitled the unit normal table that I highly recommend that you watch um, because that goes into the specifics of the unit normal table and how we can use it. Um, I'll go into some of it in this lecture and subsequent lectures for Chapter 6, but that lecture in particular is specific to how to use the unit normal table. Um, one thing I want to point out to ensure that you don't make this common mistake that when we look at values below the mean, the z-score is negative, right? Again, we learned that the z-score contains two things, the sign and the value. The sign tells us if we're above or below the mean, and the value tells us how many standard deviation units we are from the mean. But the proportions or percentages that are represented in these areas that I just colored in, they would never be read as negative. They're not negative proportions or negative um, percentages, so don't make that mistake. Those will always be positive numbers. The negative simply is in relation to the location of a score or a sample mean from the center of that particular distribution that we're working with. So to review, characteristics of the normal distribution. Sections on the left side of the distribution have the same area as corresponding sections on the right. So again, because it's symmetrical, this is the case, um, regardless of the distribution that we're working with. As long as it's normally distributed, then we recognize that the sections are equivalent on the left and the right side. Because these scores define the sections, the proportions of area applied to any normal distribution, regardless of the mean, regardless of the standard deviation. So again, we may be working with a distribution where the mean is equal to 100 and standard deviation is equal to 15, and another distribution where the mean is equal to 50 and the standard deviation is equal to 25. Doesn't matter, regardless of the mean and standard deviation, as long as it's normal, then these characteristics and these proportions that we just looked at are applicable, and we can utilize the unit normal table and the concepts of probability to draw conclusions. Figure 6.5 pertains to example 6.2 on page 157 of the text. I'm going to walk you through this example to show you how we will convert an x value into a z-score to de determine the probability or proportion of scores above a particular x value. So in this case, the population distribution of SAT scores is normal with a mean of 500. So always pull out what's important. So the average SAT score is 500 with a standard deviation equal to 100. Again, to review, the standard deviation represents the average difference between all SAT scores and the average SAT score. So given this information about the population and the known populations for normal distribution, we can determine the probabilities associated with specific samples or specific scores. For example, what is the probability of randomly selecting an individual from this population who has an SAT score greater than 700? So we can restate that as a probability statement. So the probability of an x value that is greater than 700, that's the question we want to answer. And we can follow a step-by-step -step process to find this answer um, to this particular question. First, the probability question is translated into a proportion question. In other words, out of all possible SAT scores, what proportion, remember proportions or decimals, corresponds to scores greater than 700? 
The set of all possible SAT scores is simply the population distribution. So this visual is just um, illustrating all possible SAT scores. And of course, the center score in the middle um, is equal to the mean. And we see down below here, right, this is the Z distribution. So we know the mean of a Z distribution is always going to be zero, and the standard deviation will always equal one. So again, looking at this particular figure, um, we've identified those two key components of the mean and standard deviation. And then also we identified the score of interest. In this case, it's the score of 700. 700 is larger than 500, so we would anticipate that value to be to the right of that center score of 500, as we see here. And we've identified where x equal, equals one, a 700 would be located. And the area that's shaded, this blue area, and this is a very vital step that um, you need to engage in when we are trying to find the proportion of scores above, below, between scores, um, because when you skip this step, it's hard to reconcile your answer in the end. And that's always a step that I highly recommend, that once you solve the mathematical part of the, the problem, make sense of it. Does your answer correspond with the initial question? So the next step is to identify what that x value of 700 is in terms of a z-score. So we're going to convert that um, x value into z. So z is equal to x minus mu, oops, mu, divided by our standard deviation. z is equal to 700 minus our mean of the population is equal to 500, and our standard deviation is equal to 100. So in our calculators, um, some of you may not need it, but nonetheless, 700 minus 500 is 200 divided by 100, and we get a z-score equal to 2. So an x value of 700, a, a SAT score of 700 is considered two standard deviation units above the mean. Now remember that one standard deviation is equal to 100. So that would make sense, right? If we go out one standard deviation, that would put us at 600, and we go out another standard deviation, and that puts us at 700. So now we know that this score, in terms of being considered common or extreme, we now understand that a score of 700 is, is more extreme because it's outside of that range of one standard deviation unit above and below. That, th those values are centered around the mean and very similar to the mean. This is outside of that. So we would expect that the probability, again, you start to, to um, theorize what your answer is going to be close to. So we wouldn't expect that the probability of randomly selecting a student or an individual who took the SAT to have a score of 700 to be really likely. That's not going to be the case. We're going to expect that probability, that proportion, to be relatively small because of its location in relation to the mean of the distribution. So now that we've converted this x value into a z-score, we can rewrite our probability statement and say that what is the probability of a randomly selecting a z-score from this particular distribution of SAT scores that's greater than 2.0, two standard deviation units away from the mean. And what we need to do now is utilize our Appendix B, the unit normal table, to come up with this particular answer. So I'm going to show you the z um, distribution or unit normal table to figure out how to answer this question. So here's the unit normal table. And I have a separate video going through all the components of the unit normal table. So please take time to watch that. Um, this is just an abbrevi abbreviated presentation of how to utilize the unit normal table. So we have a z-score. We calculated z is equal to 2. And um, let me just draw this out again since we had that on the original. And we had shaded to the right, right? We're, we're wondering what's the probability of an x value that's greater than 700 or uh, the probability of a z-score greater than 2.00. 
So in that sense, this area here is referred to as the tail. So the proportion in the tail is the area of interest. Um, the proportion in the body and the mean, um, the proportion between the mean and the Z are all explained in a um, in the other video that I, I referred to. So we have our z-score. So that enables us to enter using column A. This is the z-value. I'm going to make this a little smaller for just a second. And the area of interest is the tail in this particular problem. So a z-score of 2 is here. And the tail represents the proportion of scores, of all possible scores, in that region. And so we come up with 0 0.2, excuse me, 0 0.2, 0 0.0228. Or we can also say that's equivalent to 2.28%. And what does that tell us? Well, we've just answered that, that initial question. What is the probability, and that looks horrible, let me rewrite that. What's the probability of obtaining an X value, randomly selecting an SAT score that's greater than 700, which was equivalent to saying, what is the probability of randomly selecting a Z score from that distribution greater than 2? And we've come up with the answer of the proportion is equal to 0.0228, or another way of stating that is that there's a 2.28% chance that if we randomly selected an SAT score from the population, that SAT score would be greater than 700. We can also state that 2.28% of the population um, scores greater than 700 on the SAT. Now, a very common mistake that students will make, again, we have three categories, three proportions, the body, the tail, and the area between the mean and the Z. And um, if you don't shade in the area, then you're likely to, to choose the wrong proportion, to reference the wrong proportion. So let's say, for instance, I had reported my final answer as 0.9772. And it's in the in the append it's um, in this unit normal table. It corresponds to two standard deviation units from the mean. In a multiple choice assessment, that's one of the options. And you think, there, I'm done. Um, but going back to this visual here, would that make sense? We're saying that 97% of SAT scores are greater than 700. Well, this little area here is half of this side. So we know that our answer must be something less than 0.5 or 50% because of this idea that 50% um, of the scores are above the mean and 50% are below. And I should um, say more specifically above and below the median, which is also in the center and equal to the mean. So it's a good idea to um, not skip that step. A lot of students do it, um, they skip it because they're in a hurry. Y you will save yourself a lot of time if you take the time to stop, shade in the proportion of interest, and then use it to reconcile your final answer. Students who neglect to do this are the ones that make the most mistakes and get um, exam questions incorrect. So our next exam is going to have a lot of these types of questions. So you need to develop those skills, those basic skills, to ensure that you're going to respond to these questions correctly. Okay, so our final answer um, would be that this is equal to 0 0.0228, or we can say 2.28. There's a uh, the initial question was, what's the probability of scores above 700? The probability of obtaining that um, is a 2.28% chance, or again, we can read it as the proportion of the total, 0 0.0228 of all of the scores um, in a normal distribution of SAT scores are above a score of 700. Now we can also use this example to work backwards. Let's say, for, uh, for instance, we were given the mean of the SAT scores of 500 and standard deviation equal to 100, but we weren't given the X value equal to 700. Instead, we were asked to determine what X is equal to, right, 
um, when z is equal to two standard deviation units. In other words, we would ask um, uh, this type of question, what is x equal to two standard deviation units above the mean? So our equation that we learned is x is equal to mu plus the product of the standard deviation multiplied by the z value. So x is equal to 500 plus standard deviation equal to 100. And then we're saying, what is the x value that corresponds to two standard deviation units above the mean? So that's equal to 2. So x is equal to 500 plus 200. And lo and behold, we get the x value of 700. So I just wanted to use this as a way of demonstrating how a type of, this type of question may be posed. So we may be asked to look for a proportion. We may also be asked to identify the particular x value that corresponds to a certain z-score. So in the next video, I'm going to go into more detail about how to use the unit normal table. I have a separate video um, that goes into the steps, the um, components of the unit normal table, um, but what comes next in this um, series of lecture videos um, corresponds to the textbook and the PowerPoint presentation.